Turn this on. Happy Sabbath. That was just kind of nice, wasn't it? Just sitting there singing that and hearing the message. Well, we're going to be in the book of Mark today. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to follow along today in the book of Mark. I just want to get right into it today, so let's have another word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you today for your love, your mercy, your grace. Help us to understand what that means, dear Lord, in our lives. We just thank you for being here today. And we just pray that your presence again will be here in our hearts and with this message in Jesus' name. Amen. It was around 70 B.C. A young man, he was 25 years old. He was uh, a Roman. He, his family was one of the oldest Roman aristocratic families um, anywhere. Uh, they, his family could trace, so they said, and everybody knew their family line all the way back to the gods. Very prominent, well-known family. And uh, about this time, around 70 A.D., they, their fortunes had not been as good. The young man's father died when he was young, and so they had found a little bit harder times for, for them anyway. But he was very ambitious, this young man. And he was charismatic. And with his ambition and his charisma, he wanted to go far. And he knew that in his day, and, and someone born in a family like his, one of the ways to get ahead was to be able to speak very well. And so he wanted to be the best speaker in the world. And so he found, or he knew that uh, the best teacher of oratory was Apollonius of Milo, the most distinguished teacher of his day. And so he decided he would sail from Rome to where this teacher taught. And so he did that. He got in a ship, and he began to sail across the Adriatic Sea to uh, Apollonius of Milo. But while on the way, he was, his uh, ship was attacked by pirates. There was many pirates in those days in the Mediterranean. And uh, he was captured. And they thought, well, we now have a valuable prize. Here's this young aristocrat from Rome, one of the oldest families in Rome, and uh, even though maybe his family had fallen on a little bit harder times, wasn't that extremely rich, they said, we can get a lot of money out of this young man. And so they decided, we are going to put a ransom out for this young man, 20 talents of silver. Uh, and this man, though not extremely wealthy and not really well connected at that time, he declared, I am worth more than 20 talents of silver. He said, you put out a ransom for me for 50 talents of silver. And that's just what they did. They listened to him. They put that ransom out there for 50 talents of silver and waited for it to come in. Now, in the meantime, this young man was with these pirates. Now, he was not overawed by their fierce uh, you know, demeanor. He pretended to have disdain for them. And it, it, it just pretended that you know, he, he, he could barely stand to be with these pirates. He treated them not as his captors, but as his bodyguard. He, he kind of referred to them as his bodyguard. He would participate in all their sports and all their exercises. He would write poetry, and he would read it to them. He would write speeches, and he would read it to them. And if they did not admire his jokes, and if they did not laugh at and admire his poetry, he would call them illiterate barbarians to their face. And often, he would joke with them, and he would laughingly say, you know, when I get out of here, I'm going to come back and uh, do away with all of you. I'll kill all of you when I'm released. And they just kind of thought he was a little bit simple, maybe a little bit crazy. Um, and uh, certainly they thought he was a fool. Well, there was a certain town in the Mediterranean that got the message, 50 talents of silver, for this young aristocrat from Rome. And they knew uh, that uh, often what would happen is they would pledge the money, send the money, and they knew that that aristocrat would forever, for his whole life and his career in Rome, be indebted to them. 
and they took that risk. And they said, we're going we're gonna to ransom this young man. Didn't really know who he was, hadn't heard of him before. But they sent the 20, 50 talents of silver in. Well, the pirates released their arrogant Roman uh, young man. And this private citizen, he went back. And he actually went back to the city. He had never been there, didn't know anyone there. Went back to that place that had put the ransom up. <coughs> and with his charisma, <coughs> convinced them to get a crew of warships together. And he took charge of this force, sailed back to the pirate island. And there the pirates were kind of just lazily taking it easy. Beached his boats, took all of them captive, and kept his promise and executed every one of them. Who was this young man? It was Julius Caesar, who would become ruler of the Roman world. He had such ambition and such charisma that from uh, those humble beginnings, he was ruler of the world. If those pirates would have known who this man was and who he would become and who they were dealing with, they would have probably treated him a little bit differently. They thought, oh, he's funny. Oh, he's thoughtless, but he was ruthless. They thought he was weak, but he was strong. And he came back to avenge his captors. Who was this man? They didn't know. You know, some people think that Jesus is just a kind person just a righteous teacher, just some guru, some philosophical historian. And many misunderstand who Jesus is. But if you understand and know who Jesus is, it can save your life. And if you know and truly know who Jesus is and truly understand him, it can bring joy to your life. It turns sadness into joy and darkness into light. But if you misunderstand who he is and don't know who he is, you can miss out on all eternity. Thank you. And that makes all the difference in the world. Turn with me in your Bibles to Mark 4, verse 41. Knowing Jesus is essential in the Christian life. Mark 4 and verse 41. Now, we weren't going to get into this story today, but this is the story of how Jesus saved his disciples from the stormy sea. Mark 4 and verse 41. And they feared exceedingly. So Jesus, crossing over that sea with his disciples, saves them in the midst of a stormy sea. And at the end of that story, it says, and they feared exceedingly and said one to another, who can this be that even the wind and the sea obey him? Have you ever thought of that verse? Who can this be? We don't know who this is. And so Mark, if you notice here in the next few chapters, tells us in his gospel who Jesus is. He is answering this question from that moment on in the book of Mark. Who is this? You go to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 6, you find there that Jesus feeds the 5,000 in the wilderness. Who is Jesus? Who is this? He's the one that can feed 5, 20,000 people in the wilderness. He led them into the green pastures. We talked about this a number of weeks ago. He led them into the desert, and he is the good shepherd that can lead his sheep to the green pastures and feed them there. But Mark is not done because he's still answering the question, who is this man? Go further on in Mark. After Jesus feeds them in the wilderness, just as Moses fed the Israelites in the wilderness, you come to Mark chapter 6 and verse 45. And that's where we're going to start today. Mark 6 and verse 45. Who is this man? Jesus, verse 45, immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida, while he sent the multitude away. Jesus had been preaching and teaching and the great multitude had gathered there. And he says, quick, to his disciples, 
quick, get in the boats, start off to the other side, go to the Bethsaida. Bethsaida means house of light. Go to the house of light. I'm going to dismiss the crowds. I'll meet you later. It was, Bethsaida was on the western side of the lake near Capernaum, and the disciples begin to row. Look at verse 46. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on land. Now, if you know biblical chronology, the evening was there the, the four watches of the night and of the day. The evening was 6 p.m. 6 p.m. So at 6 p.m., the disciples are rowing. Where are they at? The middle of the sea. They're in the very middle of the sea. Where is Jesus? He's on dry land. He's alone on the land. He's praying. And they're in the middle of the lake. Verse 48, it says, And when they saw him walking, verse 48, Then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now where is Jesus? He's on the land. Where are the disciples? They're in the middle of the sea. He saw them, the Bible says. That lake, that Sea of Galilee, is 12 miles long and 6 miles wide. And they are where? In the middle. At least 3 miles away, Jesus is on land there in the middle of that sea, and He saw them. Can you imagine that? His x-ray vision, 3 miles away, and He sees them. And what were they doing? Why? The wind was against them, that's right. And they were straining at those oars. Now that is an interesting word, straining. In the Greek that word is besanizo. Literally, that word means torture. So they weren't just straining at the oars. There was something more than that. Now that word is used in the Bible to describe the torment of demons. It is used in the Bible to describe the torment of fire. It is even used to describe the pain of childbirth as torture. So that's what they were doing. They were being tortured. At the, they were working so hard it was torture to them. They're getting nowhere in the middle. Jesus stands on the shore. He sees them three miles away, rowing, straining, being tortured. The wind is in their faces. They are going nowhere. It is torture. Have you ever done that? Been on the, any body of water and the wind comes so so fast and so fierce and so strong, you can't do anything. It's pushing you along. It's pushing you backward, and they're straining. They're tortured. But he sees the disciples' torture three miles away, and he knows their pain. No matter where he is, do you believe this? Jesus can see your pain. Do you believe that? Standing on the shore, he sees the disciples' pain. Maybe you have some pain, agony, torture, torment, discomfort, displeasure. And in your irritation and in your unhappiness, Jesus sees you. Do you believe that? Whether he's three miles away or three million miles away, that x-ray vision sees you. There's a Japanese proverb that says, hearing a hundred times is not good as seeing once. Do you believe that? Yes, God hears our prayers. We need to pray. There's power in prayer, but Jesus sees us, the Bible says. Can you imagine that? Whatever trial, tribulation, disappointment that you have, Jesus sees that in our torture, in our pain. Then he saw them straining. They're being tortured at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night... He came to them walking on the sea and would have passed them by. Walking on the sea. Now at evening, what time was that? 6 o'clock, 6 p.m. They're straining at the oars. They're being tortured at 6 o'clock. And at the what watch of the night? Fourth watch of the night. 3 a.m. in the morning is the fourth watch of the night. Jesus comes walking at the fourth watch of the night. It's 3 a.m. How long had the disciples been rowing? Mathematicians? Nine hours they've been rowing. Nine hours they've been tortured. Uh, Jesus saw them the whole time. From 6 p.m. to 9 a.m., 
Jesus is watching that torture. Why didn't he come at evening? Why didn't he come at 6 p.m.? Some of you may be asking those questions. In my torture, in my agony, my sorrow, it's gone on for nine hours. It's gone on for nine days, nine weeks, nine years. Where is Jesus? And I've been straining, and I've been tortured, I've been striving, and I've been stressing. Where is Jesus? What is the answer? Well, the answer here is Jesus came walking on water. Can you say amen? amen. Who is this? Jesus came walking on water. When we have strain and torture and stress, what we fail to understand and when we fail to understand that where Jesus is, he comes walking on water. Now imagine Jesus in your irritation and in your torture. Imagine Jesus. You see him from afar, and he comes walking on water. Now some have said, as they've read this, they said, well, Jesus was walking in the shallows. Someone said, well, he was waiting on a hidden sandbar or sandbag. Some said, well, he came on air. There was a cushion of air there. But I can assure you today that the Bible says Jesus was walking on that water as if it was solid concrete. And the disciples were being tortured and Jesus comes walking on that water. Look at verse 49. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out. Now that word for ghost there is uh, the word phantom. In the Greek, phantom. They thought they saw a phantom. Now, come on, Peter. Come on, John, Nathaniel. You know God can do the impossible. You've seen it before. They knew that God could make a path through the Red Sea. Elijah walked through the Red Sea. The Israelites walked through that sea. Psalm 77, verse 19. Your way was in the sea. Referring to that Red Sea experience of the Israelites. Your way was in the sea. Your path in the great waters and your footsteps were not known. Jesus came walking on water, referring to that Red Sea experience. Your footsteps are not known. God led them through the sea. He led them through the waters. Moses did that. But now they see Jesus walking on the waters. Do you think they saw his footprints there? His steps were not known. But they did not know what he was doing. They did not understand. Is sometimes Jesus a phantom to you? They did not understand him. They did not understand he's recreating the Red Sea experience. He's fed them in the desert, and now the Red Sea experience, his footsteps are unknown. And the disciples say, oh, a phantom is here. They did not understand who Jesus was. Their hearts were deadened and darkened. They had hardened human hearts, and they did not understand. So our question for us today is, do we understand who Jesus is? Is he a phantom walking by? Is he someone far away looking at us? Do we truly understand him? Do we understand his purpose and plan for my life? Are you rowing a boat and the wind is blowing and the boat is going nowhere and you're being tortured by the wind, tortured by the oar of life? Do you understand? The Bible says Jesus came walking on water. Mark asked the question, who is this man? And he's answering the question, who is this man? Look at verse 49. He would have passed them by, and when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost. They phantom and cried out, for they saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer, it is I. Do not be afraid. Literally, is what, what he said in the original is, Take courage, I am. That's all he said. Take courage, I am. Do not be afraid, I am. They didn't understand who Jesus was. Take courage, I am. At the burning bush, God told Moses, what did he say? I am. 
I am is my name. I am the self-existent one. I am God. I am God walking on water. Take courage in the middle of the sea. Take courage in the windstorm. Take courage straining and striving. Take courage being tortured by life. I what? Am. I am. Do not be afraid. Here is a phantom, they said. And they were afraid. Now the word there for fear that is used is phobia. Phobia. They had a phobia of the phantom. But Jesus says to you, don't have a phobia of the phantom. Look at verse 51. Don't be afraid. Then he went up into the boat to them, and the wind did what? Ceased. And they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled, for they had not understood about the loaves. You remember the loaves? Because their hearts was what? Hardened. The disciples' heart was hardened. Didn't understand. John is trying to prove, or Mark is trying to prove what? Who Jesus was. He's the Messiah. Now come on, John, Simon, Bartholomew, Andrew. They were more amazed and more scared and more feared when Jesus got into the boat than when he was out of the boat. They were more afraid when he was near them walking on water than when he was on land far away. When he he was far, they were tortured, but when he was near, they fear. The closer they get to Jesus, the more amazed, and it seems the more hardened their hearts become. Now, I hope today that is not your experience, that when Jesus comes near, you fear. Many times when we get closer to God, we want to get closer to God, closer to the Word, and in prayer, we get a little afraid. We get a little fearful. Our hearts may harden. They did not understand. They did not understand because we don't understand. They were afraid because we fear. They marvel because we marvel. They were amazed because we are amazed. Who then is this? The disciples are given a glimpse of who Jesus truly is. He came walking on water. He has fed people in the desert like Moses with five loaves and two fishes in the wilderness. If then, like Moses, he can feed them in the wilderness, surely he can lead them through the waters and the winds and through the sea. But they were astonished. Because this man, they said, this man did not fit into any category that they knew. He was not Moses. He was not Elijah. But Mark is telling us this man, this Jesus, is God. Stop searching for categories. He is God. And so many times we try to do that. Fit Jesus into our life and our lifestyle. Fit Jesus into what I want to do. Fit him into the categories that I choose. But he didn't fit any categories that I choose or that you choose. They revered Moses, and if Moses would have showed up, they probably would have bowed lower to Moses than to Jesus at that time. Who is this man? Job 9, verse 8, He alone spread out the heavens and treads the ways of the sea. He made the bear, the Orion, the Pilates, and the chambers of the south. He does great things past finding out. Yes, wonders without numbers. He goes by me, I do not see him. If he moves past, I do not perceive him, the Bible says. God rides in the waves of the sea. Jesus came walking on water. If he goes by me, what did it say in verse 48? He came to them walking on the sea and would have passed them by. Job, what are you telling us? That God walked on the sea of Galilee and God said, take courage, I am. Do not be afraid. Do you understand? He's telling us that Jesus is God and he makes the categories and Jesus rescues in times of trouble. Verse 52, they had not understood about the loaves because their hearts 
were hardened. And their hearts were still hardened. Peter thought he saw a phantom. He did not understand. He did not recognize. Now notice the contrast. They, Jesus is in the boat. And when they crossed over, verse 53, they came to the land of Gennesaret and anchored there to a Gentile place, a Greek place, verse 54, and when they came out of the boat, now notice this, it is amazing, have you noticed this before, when they came out of the boat, immediately the people did what? They recognized. He comes walking in water. They say, whoa, it's a phantom. He gets into the boat. They're amazed and marvel. They don't understand. They get off the boat and the people, the Gentiles, immediately what? Recognize Him. The disciples don't understand, but the people of that land immediately recognize. They may not understand his theology. They may not understand his destiny, but they know someone very special when they see him because of their great need. Jesus brings provision and protection. He brings sufficiency and security. But only if we understand who he is and let Him, and recognize Him as our Savior. You can fear the phantoms, you can experience the torture alone, or you can fall at the foot of Jesus, the Redeemer. A number of years ago, a missionary went to China, a young man, and uh, withstood a whole lot of hardships, Trials. One day he was ministering in a village and a whole lot of people got angry. And a whole mob got together and they went after him in the house he was at. He ran from that house and they chased him. He ran to the edge of a river there, jumped on the boat, and they jumped on the boat. And so he jumped into the river. And uh, they had some spears, and they threw all their spears at him. And he dove under the water, dove under the boat, tried to get away, and eventually did get away. And he would tell that story for years and years. And years later, he was telling that story, and someone asked him, what Bible verse did you quote when you were diving into that water and away from those people? He said, I didn't quote any verse. Not that there's anything wrong with that. He said, I didn't quote any verse because he said, I knew my Savior was right beside me. Do you believe that? I have a question for you today. You may have fears. You may have phobias. You may fear the future. You may have torture currently and stress, strain. Jesus sees you today. Do you believe that? Whether he's three miles away or nine million miles away. But not only that, He is not simply the God exalted on His throne above, but He is the God who will come and walk with His people. Do you believe that? Do you recognize Him as God, Messiah, Savior, and Lord of your life today? Would you like to say amen to that? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, today, dear Lord, we want to acknowledge You as King of our life. And dear Lord, we don't want You to fit You in any categories that we have made. But dear Lord, we want You to live in our hearts fully. And we pray, dear Lord, that that will be reality. In Jesus' name, amen.